So I want to just touch on one last thing before we finish, which is not related to magnetic susceptibility at all, but it is related to perfusion. And it's another way for us to be able to measure blood flow or perfusion, uh, specifically not using a contrast agent. So we all know that there are now right, all these uh, concerns about using gadolinium contrast agents because of its potential adverse effects. And a perfusion technique that I was actually interested in years ago and kind of no one really paid much attention to is, has become uh, much more, I wouldn't say popu popular yet, but a good sign is that the major vendors are now actually selling this modality with their MR scanners. And I think it's something that you'll see more of in the future, so it's worth knowing a little bit about. And it is called arterial spin labeling. And this approach is essentially very similar to the dynamic susceptibility contrast approach we talked about in that we are looking at the patient, some indicator or contrast agent and watching it flow into the tissue that we're interested in. The difference is that in this case we do not have to inject any contrast agent. The contrast agent is the patient's own water protons in their blood, which we are going to magnetically label. And what I mean by that is if we <clears throat> look at two images of the brain, so if I acquire an image of the brain using one of our standard, you know, gradient echo pulse sequences, we will get some signal amplitude. And if we make a comparison between a location where there is flow, let's say the superior sagittal sinus, and tissue, which is supposedly stationary, We'll have some difference in signal amplitude based on all of those flow issues that we talked about before. If we do this a second time, however, but before we acquire the image, what I will do is turn on my RF to excite a second slice in the neck, let's say. Not to generate any signal, but to take that magnetization at this location and flip it down 180 degrees. And I'll do that some period of time before I acquire my second slice. What happens then? During the time period between applying this inversion pulse, not to the brain, but to that slice of neck. Between that time and when I actually acquire my image, what's happening to the magnetization of the spins which are flowing toward the head? They are slowly recovering that longitudinal magnetization. When I image the second time around, assuming that I haven't waited so long that their magnetization is fully recovered. Okay. The amount of longitudinal magnetization in an area containing flow is now populated by some of these spins that were down in the neck when I applied that 180 degree RF pulse. Right. Assuming I time it correctly, at least that will be the case. So the longitudinal magnetization in this location will be less than fully relaxed. Whereas the spins in the stationary tissue are fully relaxed. So we will have a decrease in signal amplitude in the location of flow relative to 
the stationary spins. Okay? So I want to show you a diagram of this. which makes the situation a little bit more complicated, but it's the same concept. So first thing is I have this image where I am, in both cases, I'm interested in imaging this single slice of the brain. Okay? And what I'm going to do is apply a 180 degree RF pulse to a large area. Okay? both the slice that I'm going to image as well as areas outside of that slice going all the way down into the neck. What happens is I first apply this 180 degree RF pulse and following that point in time I am going to image my slice. When I apply this 180 degree RF pulse I've inverted all of the spins, whether they are in the slice or they are further down into the neck. During this delay time between the initial inversion pulse and imaging, spins from down in the neck will flow into the slice. Right? So within the slice, in yellow, at the time that we image, we see that there are inverted spins that were stationary in yellow and some that were replaced by these flowing spins in red. The point is that both the spins that flowed into the image and the stationary spins all look the same. And this is our control image. On the other hand, if we do this one more time but apply that 180 degree RF pulse only to the slice of interest, then all of a sudden the spins in the slice are inverted and during this period of time, some of them are replaced by uninverted spins from outside the slice. So at the time that we image, we have our stationary spins which are inverted, just like they were in the control case, but the flowing spins that have entered are not inverted. With me? Okay. If we compare these two images by subtracting them, we can have an image where we eliminate the stationary spins and all we have left is flow or we have a flow sensitive image. So if you look just at the images for a second, on the left hand side is the flow sensitive image. On the right hand side is the control, next is the control image. And this is the difference image. So the signal, as little signal as there is, in this image is due to flow. This is signal only from those uninverted spins that entered the slice. And this is a simple subtraction. The flow weighted image minus the control image gives us this perfusion weighted image. There is an approach we can use to quantify this image and actually make a quantitative image of cerebral blood flow, which is what I'm showing you here on the right. And I can show you right, that these images actually behave as we would expect if we perturb the cerebral hemodynamics. So we expect that breathing carbon dioxide, there's going to be vasodilatation and there is a noticeable change in the perfusion signal when we do that. So this is a way for us to image perfusion in the brain without having to give the patient a contrast agent. Now the thing to keep in mind here is that there's a significant limitation, which is that this image has a relatively low signal to noise. Generating something like this requires us to repeat that imaging sequence of the control image and the flow image this was done with 40 signal averages. Right? Now we use echoplanar imaging to make it fast, but it's still, the bottom line is that it takes a long time. At high magnetic field, at 3T and higher, since we have a lot more signal, you can act, this was done at one and a half Tesla, you can do even better. 
So this is something that definitely is coming along as an option for imaging people uh, doing perfusion imaging in a situation where you may not want to or be able to give them a contrast agent.